Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. Elena Asenina, Bulgarian princess and Nicene empress, was born in 1224. She was the wife of Theodore II, Ducus Lascaris. In 1232, the Nicene emperor John III Ducus Vatatzes sought a marriage alliance with Bulgaria, which John Asen II was also eager to form as both parties were interested in pacifying the other for the conquest of Constantinople, held by the Latins. In 1235, Theodore, who was 13 years old, was married at Lamsakos to Eleanor, who was 10. An official alliance was signed, and as part of these agreements, the Bulgarian church was granted ecclesiastical autonomy. This was especially important because Bulgaria had, in the preceding years, renounced its long-standing but pathetically enforced union with the Catholic Church and returned to orthodoxy. Once completed, John III and John Asen II combined their armies and besieged Constantinople in the latter half of the year. However, between the various sources we have for the Nicene Empire, there is a drought of information for Eleanor Asenina. Eleanor is known to have moved to the Nicene court where Theodore's mother, the Empress Irene, arranged for their upbringing and education. John Asen II betrayed his new ally after the failure of their siege of Constantinople. According to George Acropolites, John Asen, under the pretense of longing to see his daughter, requested to meet with Eleanor and forced her to follow him to Bulgaria. In 1237, the Bulgarian Tsar, allied with the Latins, and then besieged the strategically important Nicene fortress Zurulos in Thrace. However, a plague outbreak in Tarnovo killed John Asen's wife, Anna Maria, one of his children, and the city's bishop. Taken as a sign from God, John Asen abandoned the siege. Later that year, he allowed Eleanor to return to her husband and resumed his alliance with Nicaea. Acropolites refers again to Eleanor in his account of events in 1246. In this year, John III Vatitzes annexed many Bulgarian towns and fortresses in Thrace and Macedonia, taking advantage of the succession crisis in Bulgaria caused by the death of the Bulgarian Tsar Coloman, Eleanor's brother and the ascension to the throne of Eleanor's half-brother, the underage Michael Asen, a son of John Asen II, and his Epirot wife Irene. The Greek-speaking population of Melnik was particularly keen on switching its allegiance. Acropolites notes that a certain citizen of Melnik, Nicholas Manglavites, who was a local notable, assembled the greater part of the population and said in George Acropolites' History, Chapter 44, we had to put up with the rule of the child, Caliman, and it was our hope that he would reach manhood, and we would have recompensed him for our misery when he came of age and was able to distinguish a good man from a bad. Since by bad luck we are deprived of this, and we have the prospect of another newborn child to rule over the Bulgarians, we might seem worse than complete fools if we were to give ourselves up to further ill luck. Choosing to spend our whole lifetime without a master, a situation from which many greater sufferings arise. But since the Emperor of the Romans has approached us, we ought to entrust ourselves to him, a trustworthy master, and one who knows a bad man from a good one, and who has a long-standing right with regard to us. For our land belongs to the Empire of the Romans. The Bulgarians acted with greed and came to possess Melnikion, and we all originate from Philippopolis, pure Romans by birth. Besides, the Emperor of the Romans truly has a right with respect to us, even if we are related to Bulgarians. For his son, the Emperor Theodore, became the son-in-law of the Emperor of the Bulgarians, Asen, and now the daughter of the Emperor Asen, the wife of this emperor, is called and is indeed Empress of the Romans. For all these reasons then, leaving aside all talk, we should go to him and bend our necks under the yoke of submission, for the yoke of sensible and mature emperors is good, and lighter by far than that of those who are still youths. Few additional facts from the life of Eleanor are known. A series of writings by Theodore II Lascaris, including a philosophical work and several letters, allow a rare glimpse into his marital relationship. 
Four letters addressed by Fyodor Lascaris to George Acropolites, the historian and Fyodor's friend, give an insight into his grief at her death. In letter 58, Fyodor Lascaris alluded to his deceased wife, Eleanor, saying, My resplendent light has set in a dark abode, leaving to me no hope of its rising. He asks rhetorically, Where is the flower of my youth? Where is the beehive of the words and wishes of my heart? Everything has disappeared. Everything has gone, leaving me behind truly alone. These words paint a picture of the marriage as one full of love and affection. In letter 59, Theodor wrote that Acropolites had already written back to Theodor to comfort him. The letter reveals that Acropolites and, and John III Vatitzes were still in the Balkans and ends by letting it be known that by the command of his father emperor, Theodor had left the city of Nymphion, changed his habit of being in mourning, and resumed eating meat. It can therefore be concluded that Theodor mourned his wife in the palace of Nymphion, and that Eleanor probably passed away there. She may have been buried in the imperial family shrine in the monastic complex at Sosandra on Mount Sipilos, near Nymphion. Sosandra was the resting place of both her father-in-law, John III Vatitzes, and of Theodore II Lascaris himself. In the same letter, Theodore Lascaris mentioned that he was already en route to the Troad, and his imminent expectation to see the Hellespont, which, he states, separated him from Acropolites. As the event was recent, and occurred close to the departure of Acropolites and Vatitzes for their campaign against Epiros. The summer of 1252 was probably the time when Eleanor passed away at the age of about 28. In Theodore's philosophical work, he eulogized the death of his wife in tragic detail. The moral pieces consists of 12 essays on existential matters such as life's meaning, death, and virtue. The work's highly emotional and personal tone shows that it was composed by the distressed Theodore who sought consolation. Moral pieces describing the inconsistency of life, which were composed during the period of mourning for the passing of the ever-remembered and beloved Empress Lady Eleanor, his wife, by the same Theodore Ducas Lascaris, of the most exalted emperor of the Romans, Lord John Ducas, before the embassy of the Marquis Berthold von Hohenberg to the same exalted emperor. Twelfth piece. I was born in the light of day, and in a worldly valley. I was brought up in pleasure, like an innocent lamb, living thus in luxury, enjoying myself and benefiting from the greatest good fortune. I gave no heed to misfortune, but taking delight, so to speak, in my own soul, I was running the course of my life replete with all goodness. For what good thing did I not fully have at my disposal? With what objects of desire was I not richly endowed? I filled my heart completely and abundantly with everything. I felt utmost joy in my soul and in my soulmate. For speech cannot call her by any other name than a like soul and the sharer of my life. O oh, terrible calamity, what can I say? I am torn apart in my soul. What shall I utter as I pour out the sound of my voice in my loss? What shall I cry out as I articulate unintelligible and ill-omened sounds? I am really absolutely shaken. Even if someone should say that the constitution of the soul is brave, an abundance of people have received my benefaction. But I wander about powerlessly, suffering this affliction. An inconsolable misfortune has seized me. A worm presses hard on my bones, causing their joints to dissolve. A chimera of thoughts burns me up. A hydra of reflections, a many-shaped and many-headed monster, tears my soul with its teeth. A viper of pain is devouring my entrails. Sorrow. A veritable dragon consumes me. A basilisk of suffering enslaves the imperial character of my free spirit. Instead of stepping on top, I am trampled underfoot. Instead of crushing, I am crushed in pieces. Instead of raising my head because of great virtues and happiness, 
I am hapless. Now I have suffered a misfortune that indeed surpasses all misfortune. Woe to me! Woe to me! The springtime of my soul has died. I am shipwrecked and have given up hope of deliverance. Everything faces passing away. For when my life comes to an end, the bond of my soul and body has by necessity been loosened. Even if someone should say that the bond is thought to continue, this will not be so. For once the soul has been released, the intellect transformed, the eyes of love blinded but in a perceptible way. For this could in no way happen in the realm of the intellect, and all spiritual powers changed. Would any other bodily part or limb be left unaffected in the body? Surely none. Indeed, the body is thought to be dead for some time before being fully consigned to decay. My essence, bodily constitution and frame are considered now to be among the living, but they occupy the land of the dead. My eyes shed your tears, my chest be broken up, my heart attain dissolution, my arms be torn out as your shoulder joints are broken all along. My legs suffer dissolution through injury to the sinews. My tongue slow down or be dead in truth. My ears and senses of smell and touch and all my organs of perception be turned to stone. And you, my whole body, with its inner and outer parts, gain the suffering of death. Dwell in Hades together with your soulmate in order to share her pain. For a bond of incomparable love made us happier than all people. But the thieving and cruel hand of Hades cut the bond mercilessly. What should I suffer? I will ask nothing but the end of my life. This cannot happen in any other way but by descending into the abodes of death and accepting the punishment of Hades and the affliction of diminution. Because I have been deprived of my life, my soul's spirit and heart's substance, and the salvation of my life, both spiritual and corporal. If you have enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe. Thank you to my generous patrons, and this has been Eastern Roman History.